1-800-273-9986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Wednesday to each and every one of you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter Wednesday to all of you. Father Mitch is in the house, ready to uh, answer your emails and your telephone questions. Half the lines are full, but half of them are still empty. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. Are you trying to call the show? No. Okay. I'm trying to make sure it doesn't go off. Okay, I got you. If you're outside the United States and Canada, you can reach us at 1-205-271-2985. And you can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Kubensky, Ace McKay, handling our social media efforts. And the one and only, Father Mitch Pacwa. Next to me. Yes. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Guess what we did for Easter? I had a nice Easter dinner. We had a nice Easter dinner. We went to South Florida. Yes. Janet's youngest daughter, Thea, her eight children, her husband, Micah. Yeah. Their two dogs. Yes. And we went to the uh, the liturgy of, of the light on Wednesday night. Oh, nice. At uh, the Maronite Parish. We went to yeah. the... Entombment of the Shroud on Friday night yes. at the Maronite Parish. Yes. And then we went to, it's, it's not really Easter Vigil, it's just Midnight Mass. Midnight Mass, right. Uh, the, and then went the, back at 11 o'clock on Sunday and it was the same Mass. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the on uh, Holy Saturday at midnight, uh, it's the the liturgy of the resurrection. And uh, the, the Maronite Rite does not have the kind of vigil service that the Roman Rite has. So uh, it's a little bit different. But uh, it has these other celebrations through the week. Every night there is a prayer service for penitents on Monday and Tuesday and for healing on Wednesday, of course, the foot washing and uh, divine liturgy on Thursday. And then the Mass of the Pre-Sanctified Friday morning. Many of you saw that we broadcast that live from St. Elias Elias here in Birmingham. And then we actually had to videotape the burial service of Christ. Uh, At our parish, we take the corpus off of a cross and place it into a casket. And the parishioners all bring flowers as a symbol of the myrrh and aloes that were brought to put with Jesus' body. And then we process with it outside and then back into the church. Uh, people reverence the, the uh, casket. Uh, in fact, it's kind of cool. Uh, I suspect they did this. Uh, they did the same thing, but yeah. only they had a shroud. A shroud, yeah, yeah, of the yeah, casket. yeah, yeah. The, the, especially in the um, uh, Byzantine churches, they use a shroud, uh, but a lot of the Maronite churches will use a cross to remove the corpus, and then the casket is lifted. Uh, by the men above their heads, and the congregation the walks yep. through underneath it. On the way back in. And the idea is that um, this is the, the entrance into the church is through the death of Jesus. Uh, so it's because of his death that we become part of the church. And, and then, of course, um, there's a penitential service on Saturday, uh, and at the end of that, we start up the Alleluias. We <laughs> proclaim Christ is risen. And then the Midnight Mass. So it's, it's, yeah, it was uh, lovely. And this is one of the great things about our faith, is that uh, we have uh, the uh, diversity of churches, and each of them, the Byzantine churches, the Armenian church, the uh, various Syri- uh, Aramaic-speaking churches, the Syriac Catholics, Maronites, Chaldeans, Syro-Malankara, Syro-Malabar. I think, yes, that's all five 
of the Aramaic churches and Coptic and Ethiopic uh, and the many Byzantine churches. All of these churches have uh, very uh, wonderful ways of expressing uh, aspects of the faith. And as Pope St. John Paul uh, had written in his second encyclical, that the church needs to breathe with both lungs, the western lung and the eastern lungs. You have some emails there? Yeah, I do. This is an interesting one. Father Packle, I live in a rural area of northern Wisconsin. My priest is part of a cluster of five churches in this area where he oversees Mass and the delivery of the sacraments. These duties are especially challenging during Holy Week, no doubt. Is it appropriate to present a gift to my priest as a sign of appreciation and recognition? I would say that would be a nice thing. And then what do you think would... Uh, 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 a kind of appropriate gift would be a uh, uh, gift certificate for gas or a restaurant. Actually, I think for him, the appropriate gift would be a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's a, a, a good amount of distance that he has. And other pastors do the same thing in different areas. Um, I, I was, uh, I had a guest from uh, Gillette, uh, Wyoming, on my show, and they have, I think, three or four churches, and they're really spread out uh, because Wyoming is so such a large area. But if you can't get a, um, uh, a helicopter, I would think a nice gift certificate for a pleasant meal or, you know, inviting for a home-cooked meal with the other priest, perhaps. Um, and then, he, this is another interesting one. We read in John 20, verses 67, about the strips of cloth in Jesus' tomb. Was the shroud of Turin a temporary burial cloth? No, the, the shroud was the cloth that covered Jesus' body in the tomb. And it was a long cloth, and it went from his feet, and then, well, uh, uh, and then to his head, over his head, and then to the top of his body. But there was another folded cloth that was uh, uh, just to cover his face. That was an extra covering over his face. Um, and uh, so, well, as it turns out, the Shroud of Turin was a temporary burial cloth be simply because Jesus was buried in a very temporary kind of way. Uh, only for the, till the third day. So, um, and, and the folding of the cloth is significant because it means the body was not stolen but departed in a very orderly way. Uh, if the body were stolen, there'd be stuff all over. When uh, you have tomb robbers, uh, looking for things, they just leave a mess because they're yeah, in the They're hurry. not going to neatly fold that thing up and leave it behind. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I'm going to go with uh, the Blessed Mother raising Jesus very well and that he just fo everything is folded up very neatly, uh, but it shows the order. Okay, and that's important. And then when Jesus was on the cross and tells one of the other two persons, today will be with me in paradise, it seems to indicate that purgatory would be a quick process. Um, of course, Jesus would have to grant that quickness to one man. Any thoughts? Um, you know, how it is dealt with uh, by, you know, for each individual is between that individual and God. Uh, it, there's no one size fits all. But I will say this. Being crucified next to Jesus, pretty stiff penance. Yeah, 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 and and he accepted it, and then finally, uh, related to that, um, we've been singing "Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom." Uh, who was that? Said it? it was the good thief. That was the good thief's saint line. Dismas. Yes, and yes, does the church recognize him as a saint? Yes. St. Dismas. I, I Oftentimes, I, I promise you I didn't read the email ahead of time. <laughs> see, there you go. Um, and does he have a saint's day? Yes, he does. I don't know it off the top of it my was, head. It was just recently. Yeah. It's during yeah, Lent. Yeah. Yeah, usually. So I, I don't know the exact date. Maybe we can look it up during the break. 
But uh, in fact, uh, I remember a really fine Dominican had started a prison ministry uh, and he named it St. Dismas. It was to help inmates after. Uh, so, yes, he's a saint, and uh, a number of people have used his, uh, his patronage, especially for various uh, uh, March 25th. March 25th. There you go. Same day as the Annunciation. All right, we'll be back in just a minute. Stay with us. It's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Thursday night, 8 Eastern, on EWTN Radio and Television. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. Idaho passed legislation protecting nearly all unborn babies, so Planned Parenthood established an abortion facility just across the border in Ontario, Oregon, within an hour of Boise, Idaho. But things aren't going so well for the abortion giant. The day they opened, Stanton Healthcare, a pro-life pregnancy center, parked their 36-foot mobile clinic out front. While it was down for repairs during the winter, a business owner loaned out her space so they could set up shop offering alternatives to abortion. Planned Parenthood is struggling to stay in business because Ontario is a pro-life town and they can't get enough staff to keep the place open. They even asked police to make the mobile clinic move, but that didn't work. Please pray for these faithful defenders of life. Follow us on social media at Life Issues Institute. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hang in there, Pam, Michael, Paul, Brian, Dolores, Sarah. We're going to get to you in just a moment. But I want to remind everybody that all your favorite EWTN programs are available right now on demand, day or night on SoundCloud. And remember, EWTN is everywhere. First up today is Pam in Petersburg, Illinois, listening on Catholic Spirit Radio. Pam, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Mitch. Okay, I have a comment and then a question. The comment was more for yesterday, but um, <clears throat> we had a dear friend who passed away a couple of years ago, and um, we said the Divine Mercy Prayer, mm-hmm. the family, those that could, um, when he was ill and dying. Mm-hmm. And so we went to the funeral up in Darien, Illinois, Um I was leave, we were leaving the church, and all of a sudden I realized that there was a divine mercy statue outside the church and inside the church. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was wonderful. It is. That it and, is. And the, and the question I have is, I have a, a Marian Helper magazine here, summer of 2020. Um, <clears throat> on page 12 and 13, it has a corona of mercy. And... It also has the picture of a chaplet called the Corona of Mercy, which is the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and it was printed in 1944. And the answer on the small bead is, through the sorrowful passion of Jesus, have mercy on us and on the whole world. And then I also have one that I had from 1958, uh, the same print, and it says, through the sorrowful passion of Jesus, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Mm-hmm. So was this change, and if it was changed, are we missing um, the honor of saying the name of Jesus? Um, I here's here's something that I don't know, and I don't know if the article said this. Um, what was the 
Polish like. That's what I was wondering. Cause yeah, because I, them... I don't know the Polish text from 1944. And here, this was one of the issues that uh, uh, delayed the canonization and the beatification and canonization of Saint Faustina. When she died, one of the other sisters rewrote a number of things she had written in the diary and elsewhere. And she made it in better Polish. You know, she was better educated. St. Faustina was not that well educated. And so her writing was very, very simple. And this other sister changed things. And what I'm going to suspect, uh, she, she made it much more flowery kind of language and such. And what I suspect is that the way that that sister had written it and, and changed it is something that... Um, uh, you know, that is now, um, you know, uh, been corrected by this careful study of the texts. So when uh, Cardinal Wojtyla was the head of the Archdiocese of Kraków, Poland, he had her writings brought there, and they worked hard to correct the texts back to what St. Faustina originally wrote rather than the correct uh, the correction. And that's what I, um, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's what I suspect uh, was, was there. Does that, uh, so that's as much as I know. Uh, I don't have that uh, earlier Polish text and that's what I would need to see. You know, I've got the, the present day one, um, uh, but I don't have that one. Uh, and and in, in Polish, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a, it talk, yeah, it talks about, certainly mentions, Pana Neszego Jezusa Chrystusa, uh, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and there may be something about the English, uh, but they were talking about comparing texts. I have to see all the originals. So um, that's this is something that we deal with whenever you go from one language to another, and um, you know. Uh, so I, but not having the textual, uh, uh, all the different texts in front of me, I can only make a guess, so I'm, I'm not going to do that, okay? We'll wait until we fi- try to find, uh, matter of fact, I'll be going to Poland. I'll see what I can find out there about the original text. God bless you, Pam. We appreciate the phone call. Next up is Michael in the Republic of Texas, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Michael, you're on with Father Mitch. Hey, you two. Um, Father Mitch, I have a... Uh... I re- well, I didn't recently. For a while now, I've heard that forgetting or not intentionally mentioning something for confession um, was uh, uh, defaulted all the other sins that you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. It, all I remember is it has been many, many moons ago since I made a confession where I did intentionally. Uh, by, forget to, uh, by many moons, do you mean literally a number of months, or was this a number no, of years ago? number of years ago. Okay. Probably 20, maybe 25. I, I can't even... Yeah, about how old would you have been at that time? Uh, 35, 40. Okay, all right. So you were fully an adult. There was some mortal sin that you withheld intentionally in confession yes all right here's what uh, here's what i would urge you to do 
is simply go to a priest and say, look, Father, I was, I didn't want to say this um, for whatever, you know, you might explain the reason, I, uh, whatever it was, but tell him that I forgot that. Um, I've been sorry for the, you know, all the, the other sins. Now I'm, uh, I'm willing to confess that sin too. Take that to confession and, um, you know, and get, get that corrected. Because if, it, if it's a mortal sin, then correctly, you, you know, you, you're, you, you negate the subsequent uh, confessions. Um, so, but that's not something that is permanent. You can go uh, to an, any priest for confession, tell them what that sin was, I would mention why, you know, again, there are various reasons that people are usually embarrassment. Um, but then, you know, this is uh, something to confess now. And, you know, I've confessed my other sins uh, for which I remain. I was sorry when I confessed them. I remain sorry for them. But now I know I need to repent and confess this too. That's what I would do in that regard. Does that help? Yes. It's yes. fairly and simple. One other quick it's, question. It's fairly simple. Yeah. What's the other question? Um, going by a cemetery uh, for a long time, I've been saying the Phantom of Prayer mm -hmm. uh, with the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit sure. on either side of that. Yeah. What about saying Lamb of God, have mercy on the souls from the cemetery? Is that yeah, more powerful that's, than? Uh, well, in terms of more powerful, that is another management issue. I'll let God be the judge of that. I think it would especially uh, uh, the, the, the power of either intercession would be strongly connected to your faith in Christ's power to show mercy to those souls. It is a great practice. When I pass by cemeteries, I also pray for the souls there, and I bless the place uh, in prayer for those souls. That's a good thing to do. Uh, I'll let our Lord uh, sort out the value of it, because uh, that's truly a management issue. Next up is Paul. He's in Saginaw, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Paul, you're on with Father Mitch. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. And, uh, what can we do for you this fine April day. <laughs> yeah, Father, uh, this question has been asked before in the past, and mm -hmm. I know the answer that was given was, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But I have a theory that I believe that the Blessed Mother never died, and here's my theory, and here's why. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says in both the Old and New Testament, the wages of sin is death, and right. all sickness and death comes from sin, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, and we know the Blessed Mother was born without sin and lived a sinless life. Mm -hmm. So I believe if God was just and true, he wouldn't allow anyone to get sick and die if they had no sin. Ah. So that's why I believe the Blessed Mother was assumed into heaven without dying. What mm -hmm. do you think of that? Well, it, there's one fly in your ointment. It's it, it, it's logical, absolutely logical, except the other sinless person who was born without sin and never committed sin died the death at the hands of sinners and died the death of a criminal in horrendous torment. And that, of course, would be our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And his death was for the sake of the redemption of the world. What is understood in the Eastern Church is that her, uh, and, and these, the, the, all of the earliest uh, descriptions that we have from the tradition of Our Lady's passing is that she died and was buried and then was raised up and assumed into heaven. Christ ascended, which is an active 
verb because of his divine power. She was assumed, which uh, assumpta est, uh, is a passive form of the verb uh, to indicate this was something done to her. And it was considered appropriate that since her sinless son died and was rose from the dead, that the sinless mother would do that too. So there's logic on both sides, and this is why we leave it. You know, the church has never defined it. It's EWTN's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch Pacwa. Hi, this is Father Mike Schmitz. Please join me for Ascension's Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year here on EWTN Radio. We're going through the entire Bible and the Catechism in 365 days. If you've ever wanted to understand what it means to be Catholic and allow those truths to shape your life, this is for you. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz, tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. The Children's Rosary is a simple and deeply moving prayer experience where children pray and learn more about the joyful, luminous, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries of the Rosary. Visit EWTN.com slash kids for more. This is Doug Keck, President and Chief Operating Officer of the EWTN Global Catholic Network. Are you a new listener to EWTN Radio? Welcome. We're here for you 24-7. You know, on EWTN Radio, you'll hear live and interactive shows throughout the day to answer any questions you may have about the Catholic faith. There's trustworthy news from a Catholic perspective throughout the day and evening as well. We offer a large selection of podcasts from our well-respected hosts and partners available at EWTN's Podcast Central. And of course, the daily mass, prayers, and everything you need to edify your soul as you search for the truth. Welcome to EWTN Radio. We're blessed to have you with us. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Later today on Catholic Answers Live, Carlo Broussard asks listeners, why don't you think Catholicism makes sense? Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to Open Line with Father Mitch Pacwa. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Just a couple of open phone lines for you at 833-288-3986. Brian is in St. Louis, Missouri, listening on Covenant Radio today. Brian, you're on with Father Mitch. Hi. You know, I was curious about something. Um, I grew up with a lot of uh, Jewish people around me. I went to school with them and things like that. Mm-hmm. And um, they seem to be very kind of uh, worldly oriented, um, whether it be the Orthodox or the Reform. And I was curious, you know, one thing I never really hear Jewish people speak much about mm-hmm. is uh, heaven mm-hmm. or what heaven is for them. And I've actually asked, asked different people, there's a girl I dated once, and she gave me an idea, like a, something about reincarnation or something like that. Yeah. But every person I talk to, I get a different story about it. No one seemed exactly certain about what it is for them. Yeah. How do yeah. you? What do you think? Um, well, you got you got the accurate understanding right there, because uh, there isn't any one clear statement or teaching on it. Um, you know, uh, it ranges all the way from uh, some of the uh, more reform Jews. The, 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 the main groups of Jewish people would be reform who uh, tend to uh, try to modernize Jewish practice to the contemporary world and usually are not quite so concerned with the practices of kosher as they are with, um, you know, ethical concerns. And then you have the conservative who are a bit more observant but also adapting. Uh, Orthodox who tend to be 
fairly uh, strict uh, in keeping kosher uh, and the, the, the rules and laws of Judaism, but they uh, do engage in the modern world. Then there are the ultra-Orthodox, who tend to be more isolated from modernity and are very, very traditional, especially, uh, and that, that is divided into various groups uh, as far as uh, which of the uh, uh, rabbis, that, that there are different schools of rabbis within the ultra-Orthodox community. Um, and so it, it really does vary. Overall, there's not much clearly taught about heaven. Um, it's not something that's uh, uh, described in the Old Testament, uh, just that there is a resurrection of the dead in Daniel chapter 12 and in Isaiah 25 and in Ezekiel uh, 37. Um, but, you know, they but they don't say what it's like, uh, and they rarely describe heaven. Uh, New and Heavenly Jerusalem in Isaiah 66, um, but it, it, it's still not clear. Uh, so that, that there's just not a, a strong concern within Judaism as much as how you live Judaism in your life. That's more the concern. I have heard some Reformed Jewish people say that um, uh, there'll be a time of peace and prosperity here on earth and that everybody will be just and have enough to eat and so on. Um, but that's fairly vague. Uh, and it's more of an historical era than the end times or heaven. Uh, so that's why you, you couldn't get a very clear notion. It's not clear. Uh, and there are some Jews who believe in reincarnation and other Jews uh, reject it. Um, you know, uh, it would seem inconsistent to me if you believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, you know, then it would just be one body. But this is where sometimes uh, even some forms of Orthodox Judaism were affected by Platonic thought, the thought of Plato, the Greek philosopher, who did teach reincarnation. Uh, uh, we got that from the Pythagorean uh, thinkers. So um, that's why it, it just varies. And, you know, one of my Hebrew teachers, she was an Israeli uh, from Tel Aviv, and she said to us in class, Whenever you have two Jews, you have at least three political parties represented. Um, it's just that kind of diversity within Judaism that uh, is part of trying to deal with it. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, thanks. At least I can con clarify the confusion. <laughs> 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Dolores is in the Republic of Texas, listening on Armor of God Radio. Dolores, you're on with Father Mitch. Hey, Father Mitch. I had a question for you. Sure. Um, would the Jews during Jesus' time, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, uh, be the first anti-Semitics against their own Jews? No, no, they wouldn't be. Uh, being anti-Semitic would not be a category that fits them. Uh, I think we have to take a look at um, you know, the, the opposition of the Pharisees and the Sadducees to Jesus as being, you know, parallel in a rough way to the kind of opposition that we often have toward fellow Americans. Um, there are certain circles, if you say you like Donald Trump, or in other circles, if you say you like Joseph Biden, you get an awful lot of opposition. Um, and we're all Americans. It's not, that's not an anti-American statement to 
uh, say that you like Donald Trump or on the other side you like Joseph Biden. Um, you know, it's just people have opposition to each other. They really disagree. And that's all that was going on there. The closest uh, thing was regionalism. You see, especially in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 7, that it criticized Jesus from, for being from Galilee. No prophet can come from Galilee. Uh, you know, uh, and there, there was a certain kind of disregard for people from Galilee. But again, that's a regional kind of dispute that happens in almost every country. Uh, you know, the, there, there can be disregard for Southerners uh, found among people in parts of the Northeast, um, thinking that Southerners are dumb. But Southerners can disregard people from the Northeast as well. Again, it's it's more regionalism than something like anti-Semitism. Does that help a bit? A bit. Um, I was just curious because it seemed like they would have carried that opposition all the way into the apostles or towards the apostles. Well, they did. You know, they they did. Uh, tried to, uh, they did arrest Peter and John a couple times, and they scourged them, and we all, they killed uh, St. Stephen, and eventually uh, St. James was the first of the 12. But remember, the Jesus told the apostles to go to the ends of the earth, and they did. So St. James, the brother of John, uh, was... Uh, killed. He was beheaded uh, in 42. He was the first of the 12 the, the apostles to die. Um, and they arrested Peter, but he was let up by an angel. And later, St. James, uh, uh, who became the bishop of Rome, he was martyred in 64, I think, 62, right in there. Uh, AD. So they did carry it on to the other apostles as well because they opposed them for being Christians. Thanks, Dolores. We appreciate the phone call. Sarah's up next, a first time caller in Imperial City, California, listening on John Paul II Catholic Radio. Sarah, you're on with Father Mitch. Hello, hello, Father Mitch and everybody. Yes. I, um, <laughs> I have a, a question that's not a question. I just wonder. Where are you from, original Father Mitch? Because I? your accent and your last name. Well, I'm. I was born in Chicago. Okay. Illinois. So it's interesting. Your your Pacwa. Where where does the last? Uh, it's come Polish. From? Oh, there you. My go. grandparents yeah. were from Poland. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I just had that. And like that, I have another question. This does have to be with our faith. And it's regarding the angels, and I found it in Genesis chapter 6 and on. And it's talking about this angel that saw women are so beautiful, and they married them, and they had kids with them, and the giants came about. I don't understand that. And if those angels could do that back then, can that happen again? Can... Mm-hmm. Well, here's first of all, notice in the text of Genesis 6, Genesis 6, it doesn't say angel, does it? Um, let me see. Oh, sons of God? Yes, like yes. Now, there is an inscription that was found at a Canaanite temple, and it described the uh, priests of Baal as the sons of the God. And they were also male temple prostitutes. And women would go to them to have a certain type of improper relationship with the god Baal. And then there were women temple prostitutes representing his sister slash wife, uh, Anat. And men would go to them. And 
that that this seems to have been uh, a condemnation of the way that uh, sex was brought into the Canaanite worship in particular, but other peoples as well had it. There were such temple prostitutes were found in a number of cultures. And it's, you know, uh, that's one of the reasons that nothing of the sexual would be allowed in the worship of the Lord. You know, that uh, nothing like that was allowed in the temple. And uh, if you're interested, there's a commentary called On Genesis. It was written by Father Bruce Vauter, V-A-W-T-E-R. And he uh, goes into a, dis- uh, a discussion of that uh, that I-, I found very helpful. So you may want to just look that up uh, and get that source there. Okay. Yeah, but it does. It doesn't say that it's uh, angels. This was something much more to do with the um, uh, the the pagans. And another thing that also, if you uh, get a chance to uh, read uh, some of the ancient Greek mythology, you see very frequently that the gods raped human beings that would take a human sh- uh, form and rape various women, especially Zeus, but also his son, uh, Hercules, would do the same, and uh, a few other of these demigods. And I, I think that it is also uh, indicating that those kind of stories were around that the whole Mediterranean. That's what I think it's also referring to. It's that, that kind of pagan mythology. Thanks so much, Sarah. We appreciate the call today. That opens up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Right after us on EWTN Radio is our new program, Beacon of Truth, with Deacon Harold Burke Sivers a former student of yours, Father Mitch, at the Not University. really a former student, but one of the best of my former students. He was a superb student. Yeah, at, uh, at the University of Dallas, and mm-hmm. he's in town. He's going to do Beacon of Truth live from this very studio as soon as we're finished here, and he's going to be on EWTN Live tonight. You're going to talk yes. about the new show. Yes, we're looking forward to having him back on. Uh, yeah, we uh, he had wonderful one of his classmates was Carl Olson, also a fine writer and doing good work, and some other really talented students. So that was um, it's, it'll be great to have him back. Awesome. So that's tonight, EWTN Live, 8 p.m. Eastern time right here on EWTN Radio and Television. Next up is Catherine, a first-time caller in Cincinnati, Ohio, listening on Sacred Heart Radio. Catherine, you're on with Father Mitch. Hi, Father Mitch. Can yes, you ma'am. teach or do something here in Cincinnati? Yes, I taught high school at St. Xavier High uh, <laughs> back in the early 70s, 72. Yeah. I was teaching okay. there, way yeah. before you did were you around. Of, did you go to the, no, I'm, I'm 72 myself. Did you go to some of the charismatic? Uh, yes, uh, I was part of the yeah. New, yeah. New Jerusalem uh, Charismatic That's Community. Right. Uh, yeah, even that's... before it was called that. Okay. Yeah, well, my husband was involved in it, and I met mm-hmm. him in 77. We married in 78. And he, when you were on, you know, he, he would say, oh, I know Father Mitch Pack was, you know. Anyway, my question has to do with after the death of my husband, um, a near-death experience um, happened to an in-law, and when she came back to life, she told, told her mom that she saw her grandpa, my husband, her sister's miscarried baby boy, mm-hmm. and with that which we buried, and another nine-month-old baby who died. She wanted to follow them, but they told her she had to go back. It wasn't her time, and then she woke up. Well, my question is, do we have bodies in heaven? And if not, why do near-death experience people see people's bodies? 
Yeah. Well, first of all, of course, we, we uh, not until the resurrection of the dead do we have bodies in heaven. Secondly, the near-death experiences do not mean that that person actually had an experience of uh, seeing those dead people. Uh, there, there are a lot of psychological elements that go on in a near-death experience, and that it's going to be framed by that person's psychological abilities. You know, they, they will, you know, we can't see things we are incapable of seeing. Um, this is uh, definitely going to be something that is framed by people who have an imaginative sense of what people were like. Now, might they have some sort of experience of those persons, but they can only recognize them in ways that fit their own imagination? Well, if, that's, if that is something our Lord was letting them have, then he accommodated to their imaginative sense so that they could understand it. But, uh, you know, just like, you know, when uh, you speak to a small child, you oftentimes have to adapt your vocabulary to their vocabulary level. And our Lord can adapt what he's trying to say to somebody in that kind of experience so that they understand it. Um, because it would be hard. Uh, we, it, it's hard for us to even imagine someone who is pure spirit. Whenever you see ghosts in movies uh, with, with special effects, they always make them look like the person because we just have no other way to imagine it. And that's what I, I suspect. Whether If it is something where the Lord is actually revealing something about heaven, he's adapting it to the ability of the person to understand. But if it, it, it also could be something from their own imagination. And this would be something that um, is not, not necessarily anything bad, not something they're doing on their own, but it would be coming from what they themselves can com possibly conceive. So that's what I think is going on there. Thanks, Catherine. We appreciate the call. Lorraine is watching us on Facebook Live, Father Mitch, and she's got a, a situation that you see various forms of from time to time. She wants to know, what does a Catholic who's trying to live their faith as best they can without <laughs> Holy Communion, because she's civilly married to an anti-Catholic who refuses to petition for an annulment to annul their previous marriage? She's been waiting for almost 14 years for him to literally, and she means literally, sign the document. But he refuses to do so. She says they have three young children. She doesn't want a divorce, and marriage counseling has proven futile. Okay. First of all, you know, I can understand that he is anti-Catholic. Um, you know, that, uh, that, that doesn't help um, but one of the issues, uh, and I don't know why he's anti-Catholic, but there is a really basic appeal you have to make, which is to respect the uh, uh, wife's conscience. His conscience may be anti-Catholic, but uh, and it could be for a secular reason, could be for a religious reason. But if he's going to respect his wife, then he needs to show that respect in a very concrete way. Um, and you know, I don't know uh, why he, uh, he would hold his anger at the Catholic Church as something that is held against his wife. Uh, I just don't know. And um, to see this not in terms of, uh, as a matter of fact, this is an, uh, an attempt to show a type of mercy and, and, and healing and reconciliation. Um, 
And I can see why uh, you I hope that there is a great deal of love in this relationship. But there has that love needs to uh, be manifested in respect for that deepest area of conscience where somebody else's soul meets God. If he doesn't believe in God, that's his decision. I'm not here to address that. But even if he doesn't believe in God, he can show respect for her dignity and say, I yeah, I, I don't believe any of this stuff. I don't like any. I don't care about it. But I love my wife and the mother of my children very much. If you do, if he does love her, then I would say show a kind and gentle respect for her faith and do something that reaches out to help her find a greater peace and reduces anxiety. If he helps her to reduce that anxiety, he too will find more peace in their home. Uh, and doesn't mean that he has to become Catholic. We'd love to have him as a Catholic. We'd be delighted. But, you know, the issue is showing respect to his wife's conscience. Just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to ask Marie's question for her in the great state of Louisiana watching us on YouTube. She wants to know if you could please explain the solemn rite of exorcism. Uh, I can only get, do it in a general way. Uh, I've never celebrated that that right, but it is a calling upon Christ to cast out the demon. It has to be done with preparation by the priest in particular to make sure he's gone to confession for all his sins. He can't hide anything. He has to confess his sins and be spiritually prepared. And then there are a series of prayers uh, that call upon the power of Christ and his church to be stronger than the devil. Christ is more powerful than the evil one, and it calls for giving the, the demon to give its name and then for it to be uh, cast out by the power of Christ. Uh, oftentimes, the, there are uh, other prayers to go with that. There are lots of prayers to go with it, actually. So it's very carefully done and covers important areas of our theology. And just like 15-second answer, Father Mitch, for Vincent, a first-time caller in Cincinnati, Ohio. He has a Protestant friend that said the Antichrist will eventually run all money. Is it true? I have no idea. Again, remind your friend that the end times direction is, you know, something that God will be in ultimate charge of, even though other people might try to be in charge um, but there is a control of the economy rather than of money. That seems to be the case. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? Lord, bless you all and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Mitch Packwell, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Matt Kubensky, and our social media maven today, Mr. Charles Beery. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow with EWTN's Open Line Thursday. Until we get together then, God bless. Hi, this is Doug Keck, inviting you to join me next time for a very